Hello and welcome to the LLG Grapevine podcast. You're listening to Deborah Evans, LLG's Chief Executive and Dennis Hall, LLG Bulletin Editor. Hello everybody. Now it's great to be back and podcasting with Dennis and I know as usual we have a collection of interesting topics for our members. Rarely a week goes by in local government without interesting cases, local decisions, thought-provoking discussions and announcements from central government. So Dennis, let's go. What have you got first, Dennis? Uh, Deborah, I know our vlog today is focusing on the latest SRA data on our sector. And I know you yourself have been in the wider media on this issue. So I thought this would be a good time to look at a Gazette article on the next generation of lawyers and new supporting roles, and indeed the importance of emerging technology. Here's the detail on this. Joanna Goodman argues that while tech has been critical to legal operations for decades, recent factors have propelled legal tech into the limelight. The pandemic accelerated digital transformation, forcing firms not just to adopt technology, but also to rely on it for all of their legal processes and business. And in the past year, law firms have been in the vanguard of generative AI adoption. But lawyers have been in the news for getting it wrong. All of this has kept law firms and their clients and the media focused sharply on legal tech. As law firm leaders have begun to acknowledge the importance of tech to legal services, they have appointed more heads of innovation and artificial intelligence, as well as IT and other operations. These functions have grown dramatically, and a new legal role is emerging, known as the Law Tech Specialist. This is designed to attract non-law graduates too. Law firms' role within tech operations and innovation do not require legal qualifications, but they do require an understanding of legal operations and processes and the culture that underpins them, as well as tech skills and project management capabilities. So firms are developing graduate programs to grow their own legal tech talent. As career opportunities in legal tech expand, more firms are developing bespoke training contracts. Some of the first movers were Magic Circle and global firms, which have entire businesses focused on tech-enabled legal operations with the capacity to train the next generation of legal technologists. Goodman cites the example of collaboration on this in the city firms in London. In 2021, six city law firms partnered with the University of Law to create a graduate legal operations scheme. This includes a four-week course and workshops covering legal tech, innovation, automation, process design, and legal project management. Now, why are these changes important to us? Well, first, obviously, the trends in major law firms inevitably result in change in our sector. Second, lawyers need to understand far more about emerging tech and how it works, or indeed, how it doesn't. They need to embrace the legal operations and technologies that underpin modern legal practice. And third, new people and new roles and functions are emerging at pace. Legal technology really is the future, and you need to be at ease in handling it. Deborah. It is indeed the future as a tool used by lawyers rather than a job replacement. Now, the key to it being a useful tool is its accuracy. And for AI to be accurate, it has to draw from an accurate database rather than the wider internet. You'll all be aware of the issues with chat GPT. Now, I know a number of the organisations that deal with legal knowledge management are looking at how AI can sit on top of their databases to ensure reliability of content. Um, but just think about what AI could do for your local authority. For example, you may have a constitution that is several hundred pages long. At present, on your intranet, you perhaps have a search function which would require the inquirer to put in words that then appear in the document. And it would then point them to that area of the document to read, which they'd then have to interpret themselves. Alternatively, you could put an AI tool on top of your constitution and your members and officers around the council can ask it questions and it will be able to answer those questions in the same way that you would because you would be responsible for ensuring the content of the database for which it pulls 
those replies from is correct. Now, this would take away a multitude of low level questions that do not need legal advice, but are generally aimed at the legal department. And it is in these areas of low risk work where legal tech can really benefit. For example, the generation of templates, standard letters and frequently asked questions can take away an administrative burden from a legal services team and also reduce the pressure on low risk legal work where the same work happens time and time again, leaving lawyers to concentrate where their advice is most valuable and respected. Now, in times of financial constraints and difficulties in recruiting, using legal tech and AI to remove the administrative workload and better enable service directorates to undertake low risk, low level legal work themselves under the scrutiny of the legal services team is an excellent way forward. So thank you for raising that, Dennis. Uh, Dennis, what have you got next? Deborah, the Supreme Court will hear the Spitalfields planning case later this year. We've already highlighted the original case in the bulletin last year. The case concerns the lawfulness of standing orders preventing planning committee members from voting on a planning application if they were not present when the application was previously considered by the committee. Now, governance specialists will be anxious about the outcome about, of this case. Here's an outline of what's involved. The Supreme Court has granted permission for an appeal against the Court of Appeal's own dismissal of a challenge concerning the lawfulness of Tower Hamlets Council's standing orders, requiring councillors to be present for the whole of a committee's consideration of an item in order to vote on it. At the Court of Appeal, in the Crown on the application of the Spitalfields Historic Building Trust against the London Borough of Tower Hamlets, the claimants advanced a single ground of appeal, which stated that the High Court judge was wrong to find that the council was empowered to make standing orders under the Local Government Act 1972, Schedule 12, paragraphs 42 and 44, removing the right of committee members to vote. And the case raises important questions around the interpretation of these particular provisions. Monitoring officers and government specialists will eagerly await the outcome of this case as one of the most common questions which often concerns them is where elected members step out of the council chamber or the committee room during the consideration and debate of an item of business on the agenda, but then return to take part when it comes to the question of being put to the vote. Can a member who leaves and returns have sufficient grasp to participate in voting on a matter? So perhaps it really does depend on the circumstances. Well, we'll find out. The Supreme Court has now granted permission to hear an appeal of the Court of Appeals decision, but it is not yet known when the case will be heard, but it is expected to be later in the year. Deborah. Well, it's an interesting question, isn't it, Dennis, when people vote having not heard the full debate. In my mind, certainly it brings concern around predetermination and, and walking into a vote um, having not listened, but already knowing how you want to vote. Um, as Dennis says, we'll see. Now, the government has announced four key areas of where productivity plans will be required. Details of what councils will be expected to include in the productivity plans have been outlined in the final local government finance settlement for 24 to 25. Now, these plans, which will be published in July 24, will cover four key areas and have been presented by obviously the levelling up secretary, Michael Gove. So what does it include? Well, there's to be a transformation of services to make better use of resources and opportunities to take advantage of advances in technology. So back to that legal tech point and make better use of data to inform decision making and service design. Uh, the productivity plans should also cover ways to reduce wasteful spend within systems, including specific consideration of expenditure on consultants and discredited staff equality, diversity and inclusion programmes. This does not include programmes designed to promote integration and civic pride and counter extremism. So it's about getting that right. Now, the final area in the plans covers 
barriers preventing activity that government can help to reduce or remove. Now, plans must be agreed by council leaders and members and published on local authority websites, and then you have to also update on progress. Um, so what will oversee this? Well, there's going to be a new productivity review panel established made up of sector experts, including the Office for Local Government and the Local Government Association. So coming soon. Um, Dennis, what's next from you? Well, back to our theme on HR issues and our sector. Getting a job or promotion in the first place is all about how you present yourself. Indeed, some form of presentation is to be expected these days in the recruitment process. And a recent Gazette article offers useful guidance on this. Here's the summary. A recent Gazette article offers some wise advice about presentations. If you're listening to this and thinking that you don't need advice on this because you're so good, then this is probably especially for you because none of us are as good as we think. Navigating a job interview is challenging, and when a presentation is thrown into the mix, the pressure can intensify. However, the good news, this is usually one of the last stages of the recruitment process, so viewing it as an opportunity to showcase your own skills and presentation prowess can turn the tide in your favour. At their heart, a good presentation is about the need to be persuasive, and the fundamentals, according to the article, are these. Number one, understand your brief. When tasked with a presentation, your first step is to gain a thorough understanding of your brief. Clarify the topics you should present on, see how much time you'll have, and ask what technology, indeed if any, you'll have access to. And equally crucial is identifying who your audience will be to shape the focus, tone, and pitch of your presentation. Number two, structure clearly. Having a clear structure is the backbone of a compelling presentation. Define the purpose and key message early on to guide your content. Ensure that your structure aids in keeping your audience's attention and makes your presentation easy to follow. Number three, keep visual aids simple. Visual aids should enhance but not distract from your presentation. Use presentation tools judiciously, focusing on key points. Opt for simplicity over complexity, ensuring that your visuals complement what you're speaking about rather than overshadow or distract. Number four, practice is key. As ever, practice makes perfect, especially in the context of presentations. Rehearse your presentation regularly preferably in front of others, to receive constructive feedback. Address nervous habits if you notice any and ensure you're comfortable with your own material. And finally, number five, prepare for follow-up questions. Anticipate follow-up questions that may arise post-presentation as you should prepare answers for a regular job interview. Develop a set of potential questions from the perspective of your own interview panel this proactive approach not only boosts your confidence by responding to questions, but also provides an opportunity to refine your communication skills under pressure. Deborah, back to you. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, interesting to reflect on the skills for recruitment. Um, as so many of you out there will know, um, recruitment these days, particularly the first stages, is quite often done online. So it's all about your tech skills as well being familiar with the platform that the interview is being conducted on so that you know how to turn your mic on and off, um, get the uh, the gallery views right, etc. Ensuring your background is appropriate, whether you're using a virtual background or your actual room, make sure it's tidy, clean. Um, checking your volume, um, eliminating any background noise, getting the lighting right, etc. And importantly, knowing how you look on screen. So if you are going to be presenting on screen, which is very common, do a practice and pre-record it and watch yourself back and listen to your voice. So when you're presenting, are you focused on the screen? Where are you looking? Um, you may be, for example, consulting notes. Where do you need to put those notes when you're presenting so that you're still able to focus on the screen? Um, I tell you, today is all about the tech. 
and how that um, uh, basically is so connected to your legal work now. Um, it's a very different world. So this is about the use of tech in getting you a job. Um, so a little bit more on that front. I've had some very good discussions with an organization called Soccer Team recently, and they're the Society for Innovation, Technology and Modernization of Public Services. And they're really looking to drive forward technical innovation, understanding, competence and tech policy within local government. And I'm really looking forward to um, a conference that they're running in March that I'll be attending there. Now, on that note and on many more you can read uh, all about the items discussed today and many more besides by going to bulletin number five which is available on the llg website now so it's goodbye from me and from me too goodbye